Next verse, please. I will get up and now go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. We see a woman who is just who is so in love that all night long she was tossing around and tossing around and saying that I am looking for the one that my, my heart loves. I cannot find my lover. I cannot find my lover. And because of that, she could not sleep. And she said to herself, I will get up and go about the city. The woman was so in love. And I want you to think about the woman as the church. This is what the church is meant to do. This woman is so in love with her man. And she's saying that because I love him and I cannot find him, I can't sleep. I need to get up and go about the city. She didn't care what she would, who she would meet. She didn't care whether she would meet armed robbers. She didn't care whether she would meet gang members. She didn't care whether she would meet, you know, violent men or women. All she said is, I will get up now. I, she placed an urgency upon herself and said, I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. It means I will search all over. I will search for the one my heart loves. You know, when you love God, when you truly love him, you cannot sleep when you haven't communicated with him. You cannot sleep when you, can't, when you haven't felt him around you. Verse 3, let's continue. And I want us to still be in that posture of fellowship verse 3 the watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city have you seen the one my heart loves Scarce, scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart I want you to give me the NLT for this verse thank you Holy Ghost then scarcely had I left them when I found my love. I caught and held him tightly. Then I brought him to my mother's house, into my mother's bed, where I had been conceived. The woman said when she went through, and again, the woman is not just a woman, but the church. She said that I love my, my lover, the one whom my soul loves. I love him so much that I was unwilling to stay in bed. I was unwilling to sleep. And even the watchmen could not find him. The watchmen that were meant to be watching, they could not find my lover. So I went ahead and pressed to search until I found him and held him tight. I want, us, I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus. I know we come every day and we hear about him. I know we come every day and we pray to him. But many people talk to him, but they don't fellowship with him. And I want us to fellowship with the Holy Spirit this hour. Just speak to him and tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you have missed him. The whole day, some of you haven't spoken to him. Tell him how much you, you love him and you yearn for his presence. Tell him how much you yearn for his presence. I know you want to achieve a lot this year, but without him, it is impossible. Without him, it will be a struggle. Without him, it would be a waste of time fellowship with him this hour and I want you to speak to him as you fellowship with him I want you to speak to him as you fellowship with him I want you to speak to him as you fellowship with him tell him how much you love him tell him how much he means to you that tell him how much he means to you he said I am coming for my bride this is how Jesus sees you and I as his bride as his bride as his bride he doesn't see you as a old as an ordinary man or woman but as his bride and so I want you to relate to him as your bridegroom relate to him as a woman that is waiting for the bridegroom to come as a man that is waiting for his bride to come I want you to fellowship with him 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 the holy spirit is not only about giving you fire the holy spirit is not only about you know causing you to jump and to sweat even though these things are marvelous and beautiful but there are times where the holy spirit wants to be gentle they are in fact many of the times he wants to be gentle with you he wants to be gentle and intimate with you that is the who the holy spirit is he's a gentle spirit 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 holy ghost we want to love on you 
we love you. KAC, we love you. We love you, Spirit of the living God. You are the bride, our bridegroom. You are our bridegroom. You are our bridegroom. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending us your spirit. Thank you for sending us your spirit. Thank you for sending us your spirit. Jesus knew this, so he told the disciples that wait upon him until he comes. Wait on him until he comes. Wait on him until he comes. He is the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of truth. He is the comforter. He is the, our guide. He is our teacher. We know him, but I want you to press on and know him more. I want you to press on and know him more. I want you to press on and fellowship with him. Fellowship with him. Fellowship with him tonight. Mazuri atarabadosha. Zele baba nimini asonte le baba bashote yaba. Rekete re baba baba shonte re baba bashota yabadosa. Rekete nimini asanta le baba bashote re baba basiata. Rekete nimini anta la badosha ta re basuriata. Yeke pani mini ashanta la badosa rika taya badosha ta. Holy Spirit, we desire more of you. 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 We desire more of you this year. We desire more of you this moment. We desire more of you in this season. We desire more of you, Holy Spirit. More of your presence. More of your presence. More of your presence. It is your presence that makes the difference. It is your presence that makes the difference. It is your presence that makes the difference. We desire more of you. The presence of God will make you hate sin. The presence of God will make you hate what the world loves. The presence of God will make you stand out. The presence of God will make people wonder who you are. Because they will see you as a force to be reckoned with. The presence makes the difference. Thank you Holy Spirit. Thank you Jesus. Thank you, eternal one. Our hope is in you, Holy Ghost. Our hope is in you, Holy Ghost. Our hope is in you, Holy Ghost. We will not get tired of fellowshipping with you. We will not get tired of fellowshipping with you. We love warfare, but we love you more. We love, you know, hardcore prayers, but we love you more. Father, we love singing, but we love you more. We love fellowshipping with you more than anything we can ever think of. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you said to Joshua, this word of the, this book will not depart from thy mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. It is our responsibility to meditate on you day and night. And therefore, Father, whether we are in a corporate setting or not, we will still worship and fellowship with you. We will still fellowship with you, Jesus. We will still fellowship with you, Jesus. For you are all we see. You are all we know. We are all, you are all we think of, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Our precious King. Our soon coming King. Our glorious King. Our one and only King. Thank you, Jesus. The center of our hearts. You are the center of our hearts. You are the center of our hearts. Thank you, everlasting Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God of hosts. Thank you, Jesus. Mashotere baba basiri atata. Reketele bado shanta tabadusa. Speak to him. Don't get tired. Don't get tired of fellowshipping with the Holy Ghost. I said earlier, the, the, the longest you are able to fellowship with the Holy Ghost will determine the capacity you have. Because it's easy to get tired when fellowshipping. It's easy to even fall asleep when you are fellowshipping. But treat him as the only one you love. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. I want us to go to the book of John chapter 5. After, yeah, after, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And the, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches in these lay a great multitude of sick people blind, lame paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So here we hear of a story. We read further in a bit, but please stay here. We, we know this story. We're very familiar with this story. That there was a specific pool that had five porches. And at a certain time, an angel will be sent now the time was unknown but there was a certain time that the, an angel was sent to go and stir up the water and there were a lot of people that were you know there with different infirmities and different sicknesses and different diseases and the bible says that the first one to step in the water received their healing and so this water was able to heal one, we can conclude and say that this water was able to heal one people at a, one person at a time. And regardless of whatever disease or infirmity you are suffering from, the water had the ability to heal you once and you had to be so swift to step in. But I can also say that probably the very first time that this incident took place, because there must be a first time for everything, the very first time that this incident took place, that probably the people, the lame and all the sick people did not know that the first to step in would be the first to be healed. So probably we can argue that after a couple of times, they, pro they then concluded that, okay, in this pool, only the first person is the one to be healed of their infirmities. But what is so interesting is that it was at a certain time that nobody knew. It was at a certain time that no man knew. All they needed to do is to make sure that they are positioned in a place where they can step in the water. So every single day while people were thinking about going to school, going to work, you know, getting married, starting businesses, there were people that had, you know, infirmities that were disadvantaged in the city, in the land, sitting at this pool waiting. So you can imagine that whilst you and I are here in the synagogue, in the temple, some people are sitting somewhere waiting to be healed. Let's continue, please. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Go back to the last verse, verse 7. So we see that this man being there for 38 years is so accustomed to one thing. He's so accustomed to a certain tradition. Stay close to the pool, as close as you can, and try and get in first. So for 38 years, this man was so accustomed to sitting next to the pool and trying to get in first. But here comes a time where Jesus also comes unannounced, right? Jesus also comes at a certain time. And now Jesus walks to this man because he knew the condition that the man was in and asks him, do you want to be made whole? And the man, instead of giving a yes or no answer, refers to the tradition, refers to what he knows, refers to what he's used to. And he's even saying that no man is willing to help me. I want us to pray because 
you know, it's easy for us to do things that we are used to. It's easy for us to come on a Wednesday and think that we have to jump and shout. And trust me, I know how to do that. I'm not even going to be proud. I'm not saying it arrogantly, but I know how to do that effortlessly. But it's easy for us to be so accustomed to a certain thing. And even as we have entered into 2023, it's easy for us to, you know, to do your business the same way that you used to for years. It's easy for you to study the same way that you used to for some time. It's easy, it's easy for you to wake up and go to work and come back the same way. It's called routine. But here Jesus did not only want to heal the man, but he also wanted to break that tradition that the man was so used to. I want us to pray this prayer because the man was waiting for a man. And because he was waiting for a man, he waited for 38 years. One thing about me is that I don't, I, I'm literally in the place where I depend on nobody. I look up to nobody apart from God, literally. And I want us to take this prayer because as we have entered into, you know, we are in this year, the year is still going, we are in March. I want us to pray and break off certain habits. And not necessarily because these habits are bad, but it's because we are too used to it that we are unwilling to receive something new that is coming from Jesus himself. Jesus was willing to give healing, but he was referring to what he's used to. In fact, he was so reliant on a man for 38 years that he was unwilling to receive his healing within a, you know, a twinkle of an eye. And I want us to pray because, you know, some of you are struggling with uni because you're used to it. You're used to doing a certain thing or, you know, studying the same way. You're used to going lectures and doing things as a similar, you know, a certain way that is, is so difficult for you to break off. And as a result of that, you are not seeing the new next thing that is yet to come. Some of you are used to even doing your own ministry a certain way. You're used to preaching a certain way. You're used to praying a certain way. But God is saying that I have come to give you something new. God is saying that this year I want to give you something new. You've been waiting for a man for 38 years. You've been waiting for a man to help you whilst the Messiah was standing right in front of you. I want you to lift up your voice and say, Jesus, I will look up to you. You are the one that I will look up to. I am willing to be versatile. I am willing to be dynamic. I am willing to be open to change. I am willing to be open to new things. So lift up your voice and begin to pray. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Mazuri atalabadosha. Zele baba shonte ne maku sabra talibiriata. Mantole baba ba shote riba ba suni mini akanta reba saya reketi ni mini ashanta la baba ba suri katande lele ba shuta reketi ni mini ashanta. Father, we refuse to be set in our tradition. We refuse to let tradition take over our lives. We refuse to be accustomed to the things of the world that we will be unwilling to change. We refuse to allow the things of the world, the patterns of the world, the philosophies. Of the world the ideologies the system of this world to encapsulate our minds we refuse to be accustomed to the things that we were raised with we refuse to be accustomed to the principles of the things of the world but we want to be open to change we are willing to take on that new thing that is coming from you we are willing to take on something new we are willing for a change we are ready for a change pray and ask God for a change pray and ask Ask God for a change. Maybe the reason why your life is still stagnant is because you are doing something the same way you did it last year. Maybe the reason you don't see progress in your prayer walk is because you're trying to do something the same way you've been doing it all the time. But I want you to be ready for a change. Jesus said, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to see a difference? Do you want to experience something new? Do you want to release receive something different something that you've never experienced before lift up your voice and say father i will look unto you 
David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Your help does not come from your mother. Your help does not come from your father. Your help does not come from your doctor. Your help does not come from your physician. Your help does not come from your pastor. Your help does not come from your mentor. They only help you to a certain degree, but your ultimate help cometh from the Lord, for he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus. Reketini mini antala bado shata. Reketini mini asanta le baba suria kata. Father, we are ready for a change. We are ready for a change. We are ready for a change. We are ready for our change. In our walk with you, we are ready for a change. We are ready for a change. Masone meko shata. Mantole baba basuka tere baba ba. Senteni mini akusha tere baba basunta. Reketini mini antala brakunta na 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 mosha. Reketini mini antala badosha kata. I am ready for a change, oh God. I am ready for a change, Holy Spirit. I am ready for a change, Holy One. I refuse to be accustomed to the same thing. I refuse to make the word of God of non effect because of my tradition. I refuse to make the word of God of non effect because of my tradition. I refuse to make the word of God of non effect because of the worldly principles I'm used to. Ask the Father for a change. Ask God for a change. Something new. Something new. Somebody sang a song and said, Do something new in my life. Do something new in my life. Something different. Something different. Something I'm not used to. Something I'm not acquainted with. Do something new. Marusa Patiriata. Rapapantun Takatiya Bada. I'm sick and tired of the same old thing, oh God. I am ready for a change. I am ready for a change. A change in my mind. A change in my way of thinking. A change in my way of conduct. A change in my behavior. I am ready for a change. The church is ready for a change. We will not serve you like 30 years ago. We will serve you the way you want to be served in the season. We will not approach you like we always do but we want to approach you like how you want us to approach you in the season rikatana makunta prikatapa rapapapantunta pantua rikapani minuzuri atata impali ashatata we are ready for a change the church is ready to move along with the holy ghost rapantani miniasa reteli akunta we will not refer god to the things that are of old we will not refer god back to things of this world the things that we what we are used to but we will refer God we would not refer him back to the things we are used to but we will wait upon him and be ready for a change and be ready for a change and be ready for a change Make us dynamic, make us dynamic, make us dynamic. We want to be versatile. We want to flow with the spirit. 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 We want to flow Shente ne me me kusa branta, ishe ne mako shanta la brakita rababa. Senti ni mi akasa kata ndele madosha. Thank you Holy Ghost, mazuni mi anta. Reke papa panta le brea ziri atata. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, our last prayer, and I still want us to pray on this again. Okay, I want us to pray. Please give me the same verse. Please give me the same verse. You know, this verse makes us to understand. Please go to the next verse, actually, verse 8. Thank you. No, 
I go back to the verse six, please? The Bible says when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew already, he knew already. You know, Jesus knows already your situation. He knows it already. Whatever you're going through, he knows it already. It's nothing new to him. Whatever is happening in the church, whatever is happening in the economy, whatever is happening in the world, Jesus knows it already. And so the Bible says that Jesus knew. He saw him and he knew already that he had been in that condition for a long time. In fact, Jesus knew that this man's condition was not just a year ago. It's not been there for two years. It's been there for a long time. And so sometimes we approach God and say, God, don't you know? Don't you know I've been in this? You know, don't you know? And God is probably looking at us like, are you, are you for real? I know. But you know, sometimes Jesus can be right in front of you and you don't know. Jesus was right in front of this man. His solution was right in front of him. That which he had been looking for for ages, for th guys, 38 years old. Most of you are not even 25. It's only a few of us that are above 30. Most of you are not even 25. So you can even imagine, even there is even, I don't think there is anyone that is 38. So it's a sign that this man had been waiting. No, he was 38 years old. He had been waiting there for 38 years. How old was he? Is it maybe we can say that was all his life? Oh, probably, you know, at the age of five, that was when he had that infirmity. But we don't know. But all we know is for 38 years, this man was lying at the same spot waiting for a man. Guys, do not look to a man. God uses men, but they are not the souls. They are channels. Many of us are too, you are waiting for somebody to help you. I was speaking to, some time ago last year, I was speaking to one of my friends in Ghana. And he was saying, you know, Liz, the Lord wants me to be a doctor, but I actually went to study business. But, you know, growing up, nobody helped me. And throughout the conversation, nobody helped me, nobody helped me, nobody helped me. And after I hung up, I was like, ah. So this guy will, you know, be taken to glory at a certain point of his life, maybe when his time is up. And he will get to heaven and tell God, nobody helped me. Because throughout the conversations, like nobody's helping me. And some of us, we are thinking, oh, somebody needs to help me. You know, somebody needs to help me. Yes, but God is saying, look after me. Let me be the one to send the right people. Because if you look up to people, you might be expecting help from the wrong person. You might be expecting help from the wrong people. And Jesus wants us to focus on him. Jesus was saying that, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? And he goes back to his situation. So he's not even, it's a sign that his mindset needed to be renewed. He's still accustomed to his infirmity. How he's waited 38 years. How nobody has helped him. And these are the people that you meet and they are so bitter about everything. They are bitter about why, you know, their uncle did not help them. Their sister did not help them. How one auntie did not help them. How they are, even their own mother did not help them. But here was a solution standing right in front of him. And I don't want us to just apply this on a spiritual level. But even in your respective fields, in the area of business, in your career, in, 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 your, in, your, in your education, don't look for somebody to help you. Think about God. Place your focus on God. The solution, he says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to graduate? Do you want your business to excel? Do you want to be promoted at work? You don't necessarily need to be, you know, to be acting fake to one manager for them to promote you. You don't need to seek favors from people. Just look and focus on God. So I want us to pray this prayer. The Father, change my mindset change my mindset some of you are waiting for the economy to get better mm. you wait long honestly you will wait very long you're waiting for somebody to send your cv somewhere you will wait long wait upon god god has a way he has better connections than you and i god has better connections than you and i he's he has a way of you know connecting you to someone that you least expected and he does it effortlessly i want us to pray the father change my mindset change my mindset shift my mindset i will focus on you 
I will focus on you. Masotere bada washata. Mantele baba baba suta. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Shetene mama suri atata baru shata. The Father, work on my mindset this year. Work on my mindset this year. Work on my mindset this year. You are my solution. You are my solution. You are my hope. You are the one I look up to. In my spiritual life, I look up to you. In my spiritual walk, I look up to you. In my business, I look up to you. In my education, I look up to you. In my business, I look up to you. In my family, I look up to you. You are my only hope. You are my only hope. You are the hope of the church. You are the solution to my problems, the solution to my life. I will not look up to any man. I will not look up to any man in my giftings, in the operation of my giftings, in everything that I do, in every endeavor. I look up to you, Jesus. Reign in my life. Reign in my life. Take dominion over my life. Take dominion over my life. All the days of my appointed time, I will look up to thee. I will look up to thee. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be made well. I want to be made whole. I want to be made whole. I look up to thee, Lord, not to any man. I look up to you. You are the source. You are the source. You are the source. Shetere.
my safe refuge. You're my treasure, Lord. You are my friend and king, the most anointed one, the most holy. You are my hiding place. Oh. You are my hiding place. Oh, you are my hiding place. Oh, oh, oh. oh. you're the most holy.
highest praise, hallelujah, 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 oh.
Father, you deserve 
the glory for from you are all things and to you are all things father you deserve the glory For from you are all things, and to you are all things. Father, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. We give you the honor, for you deserve it all. glory you deserve the glory and the honor and the praise you deserve the glory you deserve the glory we give you all the honor tonight for you deserve the glory you deserve the glory all the praise all the glory you deserve it you deserve the glory the glory you deserve the glory all the glory lord all the honor lord you deserve it all you deserve the glory all the glory lord all the honor lord you deserve it all you deserve the glory all the glory lord all the honor lord you deserve
I want us to pray one prayer. With your hands lifted all over the room, I want us to pray a prayer. Tonight, I want everybody to be in a place where we ascend to a certain location whereby when God is releasing gifts, He will not leave you out. This is our month for visitation. And I pray that nobody under the sound of my voice after tonight, nobody under the sound of our voice will leave here without a visitation. I want us to pray and ascend to a certain height in the spirit. Because I believe it's only when you get to a certain place that God can visit his children. And I pray tonight, I pray tonight, that if God is looking for somebody to visit, he will come to your address tonight. If somebody is looking for God to visit, he will not leave you out tonight. And I just want somebody to ascend in the realms of the spirit for a few minutes. I want us to get to a certain altitude before we go into anything we do tonight. Ascend tonight in the realms of the spirit. Tonight is a night of you and God. You want to ascend tonight. You want to get to a certain place. So if that is you, I want you to lift up your voice right now. And I want you to pray a certain prayer. And you're asking the Lord, I want to ascend right now. I want to ascend right now. I want to get to a certain place. That Father, when you are visiting your children, you visit me. When you are visiting your children, you don't leave me out. Come on. Somebody lift their voice and begin to pray tonight. Somebody lift their voice and begin to pray tonight. Come on. Somebody begin to pray tonight. I want us to get somewhere. I want us to get somewhere. Yes, Lord, this is our month for visitation. Come on, somebody pray tonight. Somebody pray tonight. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We are ascending all of us. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. It's your prayer that can provoke the heavens. Come on, lift your voice. It's your prayer that can provoke the heavens tonight. Lift your voice. Come on, somebody pray tonight. 
Come on, let's fill this place with a prayer tonight. Let's fill this place with prayer tonight. Come on, fill this place with prayer tonight. Your prayer can provoke the heavens. Your prayer can usher angels in tonight. Your prayer can open your personal heavens. Oh Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on, come on for a few more minutes. Come on, lift it up, lift it up, lift it up, come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Begin to pray tonight. We want to get to a certain place before we do anything. Mantora palima doska prayanda aliva doske prayamanosa. Mama rema doski panda aripenda alie. Aka mama 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 matara doska paya. Aye palima da katura mata kachenebe. Come on, somebody pray tonight. Somebody pray tonight. There's a visitation awaiting you tonight. There's a visitation awaiting somebody tonight. Come on, let's usher him in. Let's usher the King of Kings in. Come on, somebody pray, somebody pray. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice right now. Lift your voice. And begin to pray. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Kalusha praya manoska paya dale manoske pele pele beha. Apala bara shaka da apala bara bara ba. Apanda kapra doske pa doske pele pele a doska pala. Alo pa pale manoske prende kapula bara ba. Masa kapra doska pala bara 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 ba. Akanda kapra doske prende kapala manoske pele pele. Come on, pray, come on, pray. Come on, somebody lift their voice and pray. Rapaloski be a toshke preanta. Shabrada kapalos ke prende le me debe. Raka papaya na kamalit yung voice. I speak in tongues in the Holy Ghost. My spirit cries. Elohim Adonai I speak in tongues in the Holy Ghost my spirit cries Elohim Adonai Apollo Shapra Adapalabadaba I speak in tongues in the Holy Ghost my spirit cries, Elohim Adonai, Aku Shabra Adakala. We want to usher him in tonight. I speak in tongues, Elabra Adolaba, in the Holy Ghost. My spirit cries, Come on, lift your hands and declare this tonight. 
cried. Your spirit cries. Elohim Adonai.
60 seconds, begin to pray the Holy Ghost. Come on, begin to pray the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Akula manos ka prahandas. E palu ka palimandas ke predene menama. Your spirit is rising. Your spirit is rising. Your spirit is rising. E palu shalamana. Paluna manos ke prendas kula pa antala manos. My spirit is rising. It's rising. Matoka brando ske pe anda kapala manos ke predene. spirits are at a level to receive this is our month of visitation father visit us tonight every single one of us visit us tonight we will leave here with a tangible testimony it's a revelation it's a confirmation it's a visitation it's something we needed before we came it's happening we thank you we glorify you in Jesus name and let the children of God shout a big amen, amen. Oh, come on, say amen like you're not hungry. Say amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Am I speaking to one or two people? I said hallelujah. Amen. Tell the person next to you, I'm so happy to see you tonight. <laughs> you may take your seats. You may take your seats. Praise the Lord. I am very, very glad to be in the house tonight. I'm very happy to see your wonderful faces. I bring you greetings from Germany, from Hamburg. Amen. Shout out to my, my Germany KC family. Oh, let's celebrate them. Amen. I want to thank the Lord for the life of our apostle, our father, Pastor Randolph J, First Lady, patience. Oh, come on, is that how we honor in the house? We give God glory for their lives. Amen. And as you are standing, I want you to also honor my wife. I'm with my wife. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for honoring her. You may take your seats. Thank you for honoring her. As you honored her, your wife will also be honored. Your husband will also be honored. I believe it and I pray so. In Jesus' name. I love being here. Every time I come back, this is home. This is home. I, I, was, I, was, I was here before I was shipped. Um, before I was shipped. This is home. Every time I come back, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so, so, so glad. And my, my heart is just full. And every time I come, I go back with a new sense of the revival fire that is, that is burning in this house. And... and Every time I come and go back, there is something that shifts in Germany. There is something that shifts in our church. And I pray as I've come this time, even to release, may I also receive. So that I can go back and also give out again. Amen. And I want, before I go into what I'm going to speak about tonight, I do want everybody to know that revival is here. The UK is in a very very specific time and season revival is here it's not something that we should be praying about it's not something we should be looking forward to it's something that is already here how many of us agree with that the, the prayer that you should be praying is not father bring revival to the UK 
the prayer you should be praying is, Father, align me with what you are doing in the UK. Align me with what is happening so that I can be on time and in season. It's one of the prayers I pray often. That, Father, I want to be on time. I want to be in season. I want to be in your will. And that should be your prayer when it comes to this revival. That, Father, let me align with your purpose. Whatever responsibility that you have for me in this time and this season, let me realize it. Let me not just realize it, but let me fulfill it. Because when it comes to revival, I believe that we have two groups of people. We have participants and spectators. We have people that are participating in the revival, and we have people that are just watching the revival. And I pray nobody here will be a spectator. I pray that you'll be somebody that when years are passing, your grandkids will ask you the revival of 2023, and you have something to say. You have something tangible to say, I I was a part of it. Not that I knew somebody that did something. But I was actively a part. You want to be a participant. You want to be an active social member of the revival. Because even when it comes to participants, and spectators are the people that are waiting for the whistle at kickoff before they involve themselves. When you go to a football game or any sporting activity, the spectators come at a specific time just when the match is about to start. And that's when they are... And if you are going to have that mindset in this revival, you'll miss it. If you are waiting for a whistle, you might never hear it. Because the whistle you are waiting for might come in the form of a bang. It might come in the form of, of, of a shout. It might come in something that you're not expecting. So if you're waiting for something specific... Be careful. Participants prepare even weeks ahead of time. I played football before. We'll we'll have a match on a Sunday, but we'll be preparing weeks ahead. And just because you're not in the starting 11 doesn't mean you're not important. Oh, can I go here a little bit? Just because you're not playing the 90 minutes doesn't mean that you are not relevant. Because even the kit man is necessary. Because without the kit man, the players on the field will not be able to identify themselves. So the kit man will never score a goal. He will never score or he will never be involved or he will never get the highlights. But his involvement is so necessary. And I believe I'm speaking to somebody that feels like they are a bit, they are a bit hidden. They are a bit behind. They are a bit behind the scenes. They feel like they're not relevant. I'm here to speak to somebody and say that you are relevant. Your involvement is needed. Just because you're not in the starting 11 doesn't mean that you're not important. Because even the players that never touch the ball, when they win the trophy, some of those players, they get medals. They would have never kicked the ball in the whole tournament. But when the team wins, you see them coming out to receive their medal. Why? Because they were training with the boys. They were encouraging the boys. They were the ones even making it so competitive that the ones playing will even play better. So the revival has many roles and responsibilities. I pray you find your role. Your role might never be to hold the mic. It might never be to hold the mic. But I'm I'm reminded of a man called Ananias. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 9 that Saul had his encounter. And Ananias was told, go to the house where Saul is and pray for him because he is waiting for someone to deliver him. If we didn't have an Ananias, we would never have a pool. Ananias in chapter 9 is the only time we are hearing of his name. Don't be mistaken of the Ananias in chapter 5. He died. Ananias in chapter 9, he is only referred to in that one instance. But because of his obedience, because of his involvement, we now have two-thirds of the New Testament. Oh, there are some Ananiases in the house tonight. Yeah. There are some people that you will never, ever be mentioned. But you are as important as the one that's mentioned. And I believe I'm just saying that for somebody. I believe it's just for one person, maybe two. 
But I needed to say before we started anything. Because this revival that is here, guys, let's take it serious. There's a certain price that you will have to pay so that you can be relevant in this revival. There's a certain standard you must meet. There's a certain requirement everybody must attain. And that's why I'm even just going to link it into what I'm actually going to talk about tonight. The Lord has, has, has burdened me. He has burdened me over the last few weeks to touch on a topic. And I said to myself that if I am in my house, I will, I will not let my fellow brothers and sisters go without hearing this word. I was here two weeks ago and, and, and Apostle declared that this is our month. I was sitting right here. And Apostle declared that this is our month of visitation. And I was standing here and something hit me straight away and said that he's going to ask you to preach. I rebuked the, the voice very quickly. Because I said, mm, Apostle Emmanuel has come. Elder Charlotte has come. Now Henry Ajiman is here. You are too kind. You are too kind. You have helped me. But something told me, and I even told my wife, I said, this might sound like I'm boasting, but I believe Apostle's going to call me and ask me to preach. And she said, mm. in her head, I'm sure she was like, oh. <laughs> but it was just this Thursday, Pastor said that Wednesday you are coming. I said, no problem. I already, I already had the sermon prepared. I'm telling you, I had the title already. No, no, no. I had the title without even being called. Oh. 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 Can I stay here for a little bit? I had a title without being called. What does it mean? Preparation. It means ready at all times. Listen, you will never know when you're being called. The people that are in the army, even, even the people driving the buses are preparing themselves for war. The nurses and the teachers in the army, the people that you would never think will ever go on the front line, they are practicing and preparing as though they are fighting the next day. Because you never know when you will be drawn out. You never know when somebody else will die and there is a vacancy. Oh, Jesus. And I believe, I believe that in the kingdom, in the realms of the spirit, are many vacancies. And God is looking for people that are just ready. People are just prepared to fill in the gaps. I was ready. I had, I had the sermon prepared. Oh, Jesus. I pray you'll be blessed tonight. Pray you'll be blessed tonight. Come on, just for 60 seconds. Pray that the Lord will not miss you tonight. Pray that He won't miss you. He cannot miss you. Jesus. The cost of living crisis. I'm sure some of you saw the tattoo and be like, huh, what's going on? The cost of living crisis. I'm burdened by this message. The cost of living crisis. I don't know, by show of hands, how many of you have felt the pinch? Yeah, oh, be honest. Don't worry. You've small small for the pinch <laughs> as I said me I was not in, I was not here I was in Germany and and I said to myself because in Germany there was something I missed there was something in the UK that I missed I missed chicken and chips I never thought I would miss chicken and chips I've been eating chicken and chips my whole life I've gone maybe one year without eating chicken and I felt I had missed it because Germany they don't like chicken and chips like that. They have kebab, kebab donut, donut, donut. So, so I said to myself, when I come back to the UK, I'm going to have my chicken and chips. But I said, not just Dixie's or Tennessee, I'm going to Nando's. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to send those. I was there. This one, I didn't ask nobody to go to. I went by myself. And I said I wanted, I wanted the, the wings roulette. Yeah, yeah. And I never knew how much it cost before, but the, I saw the, the menu and it said, it said something like 21 or 24 pounds. And I said, hey, what's going on? But because of my desire for it, I bought it and I ate it. So then the next day, I'm in the off license. And I grab a can of Coke. And then the man says, 90p. I said, what's happening here? He said, we had to increase the price by 30 pence in the last two weeks. I pray you are sensitive. Then we go to petrol. I remember when petrol, I bought petrol once for 99p a litre. I remember the time. I came back and I'm now filling my tank and it's saying something like 192. I said, why? Everything seems to be increasing. And then I went to top up my electricity. And usually maybe 50 pounds is okay for the week. I put 50 pounds on the key. Two days, it's gone. <laughs> Two days, it's gone. And they told me that gas and electricity has risen by 150%. Everything is increasing. The price is increasing. So I sat down for a second. I said, what is happening? And then something hit me that everything that happens in the physical first takes place in the spiritual. So if the price of things are increasing in the physical, I feel my help already. If the price of things are increasing in the physical, it means there has already been an announcement in the heavens that the cost of living in the kingdom Woof! The cost of living in the kingdom has increased. And I'm here to announce to KC UK. The cost of living to fulfill the purpose of God in the nation. The cost of living to ensure that the agenda of God comes to pass has increased. So it means that what you were doing last year if you think that it will suffice this year, the cost of living has gone up. If you were praying one hour last year and you think praying one hour this year is enough, the cost of living has gone up. If you were studying your Bible for 30 minutes a day and it was okay, it took you through the year. I'm here to tell you the cost of living has gone up. There is a standard requirement now. And that standard requirement is not the same as previously. Because one thing about God is every time you meet him, he upgrades. So you think that I've gotten him now. By the time you blink, he's moved. So the journey of Christianity is a constant moving forward journey. It's a journey where we are always going from one level to the other. You can never be satisfied. You can never feel like I have gotten it now. And there are some of us who have been saved for maybe 15 years, 10 years, and you have gotten to a certain place and you've become stagnant. Nothing is moving. Nothing is increasing. The tongues you are speaking are still the same. The number of scriptures you can, you can recite off head are still the same. The length of time you can pray for is still the same. The amount of times you can sow in the year is still the same. They said that the cost of living physically has gone up so much that life has become expensive. And if in the spirit the cost of living has gone up, it means that there is a certain price that everybody has to pay. 
And the reason why I'm so I'm emphasizing so much on this is because we're coming to a time, ladies and gentlemen, where if you don't take care, you will not finish. Do not, the Bible says that he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fools. It means that the prerequisite to falling is thinking you are standing. Oof. Somebody missed it. What comes before a fall is the mindset that I'm standing. But you have the mindset. If you have the mindset that anything can happen at any time, you'll always be on your guard. So the Bible tells us to be sober and to be vigilant. Because there is an adversary. The Bible calls him your adversary. He's not mine, he's yours. He's coming. Looking for his next victim. He has planned you out. He, he has sussed you out. He knows where best to get you. And he is looking for the perfect opportunity. So if you are not on your guard, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, if you can give it to me, it says that there will be a great falling away. Before that day comes, there will be a great falling away. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed and the son of perdition. Give me the amplified just there. I like the one, the way the amplified says it. It says, let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come except the apostasy comes first. Unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians. He's not talking about unbelievers all. There's a scripture that scares me in Matthew chapter 24 verse 22. It says that even the elect can be deceived. I don't know if you understand me. Even the elect. It means where the Bible says that, that many are called and few are chosen. Even amongst the chosen. Some of them. There is a possibility and a potential of those people falling away. So if you are not even in the chosen, then the chances of you falling are even higher. So the standard in the kingdom has increased. What we need to do to make it has increased. There are many things that are being redefined in this season. One of the things that are even being redefined is lukewarmness. Because what we always thought was lukewarm was being in church on Sunday but being on the club on Saturday. That's what we thought was lukewarm. And it is lukewarm, of course. But the standard has increased. The cost of living has increased. So it means that if that was the standard, it means that now there's a higher standard. So it means that what thing can be, one thing that can be considered as lukewarm is even you being obedient on Sunday, disobedient on Saturday. You, you adhering to the voice of God on Tuesday and not on Wednesday. Lukewarmness is even you only serving in church but not at home. Some of us, the only place we serve is church. The only place you are submissive is church. So that's why your mom is even confused when you say you are going to church. Because there is no evidence of the church in you. Your workplace don't know if you are here or there. You are scared to even talk about Christ there because you know you are lukewarm. You don't show the same attitude you do in the building in your workplace. So they ask you, what happened to you this weekend? What did you do? And you're like, nothing much. <laughs> what was your weekend like? Same old, same old. Because you know the minute you say that we had all nights. And then after the all night, we had choir rehearsals. After the choir rehearsals, we had Sunday service. Morning and evening. Those of you in Hatfield. <laughs> the minute you say these things at your workplace on Monday, Stephen. They'll be like, is this the same person? You are lukewarm. 
So the standard of lukewarmness has increased. <laughs> it's important that we understand this principle. Because if we don't understand this principle, I'm telling you guys, life will be long. Life will be long. So the question you might be asking me right now is, so what do we do? If the standard of living in the kingdom has increased, how do we survive? Because I've been hearing reports, I've been reading the news, I've been watching, and people are complaining. People are saying that it's better to be dead than alive. I'm seeing people not turning on the lights at home. I'm seeing people, I'm seeing people, they're now wearing gloves and scarves in their house. Wearing shoes, people are suffering. Oh, you, you come home, your, your mama's cooked for you. Food is prepared, everything is in the fridge. But there are some people you know, it's hard. And if this is the same thing in the kingdom, how do we survive? How do we survive? In the physical, they are saying that it's better to be dead than alive. <laughs> in the spiritual, the strategy to survive is to die. <laughs> oh, oh. Because in your death, you will live. God is looking for dead men. God is looking for dead men. We thought we had died. You are alive. I'm telling you. We thought we had died. We are alive. No, 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 no. We are alive. We are too alive. There are instances in the day you know you are alive. Even just today. Analyze your life. Analyze today. Today alone. The way you spoke, the way you spoke to the bus driver will tell you if you are alive or dead. The way. You, you spoke to your siblings. The way you even interacted, the way you even came to church will determine whether you are alive or you are dead. We don't just die by praying four hours. Old. We don't just die by, by completing an all night and saying I've died. We don't just die by sowing a seed and said yes, I'm dead. Death, death, is something ongoing. The more you die, the more you want to die. The more you want to die, the more you die. This is how it works. You die unto die. It's from death to death. The minute you think you are alive, it is an indication that you really... No, the minute you think you are dead is an inc in implication that you are really alive. The minute you think you are dead, the minute you say, I've died, it's the proof and the sign that you are alive. God is looking for dead men. Oh, because this kingdom cannot be advanced with people that are alive. Can I give you a few scriptures? Yes, is that okay? Yes, Thank you. I'm going to run through some scriptures. Colossians chapter 3 verse 3. You can write these down. It says, for you died. For you what? Died. And your life. I've always, I've always felt that this scripture didn't make sense. How could I die and still have life? It says, for you died, and your life is hidden in Christ, in God. So when you are praying, Father, hide me in Christ and in God. It's not just a prayer you pray with your lips. The only way you can be hidden in Christ, in God, is to first be dead. I'll show you today, we are, we are climbing, we are building. The only way that you can receive total protection and preservation of your life is when you are hidden in Christ, in God. God doesn't hide men that are alive. Because even for Jesus to be received back in heaven, he needed to die. For you to receive life, it required someone to die. 
For you to enter the kingdom of God, it required somebody's blood. It means for you to remain there. It requires more death. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is not going to die again. He's not coming to die again. But somebody must die. It's you. It's me. I'm saying this because I know what God wants to do in our generation. I know what God wants to do and I know what he can do with yielded men. I read, I read stories. I watch revival programs. I see history, church history, and I can see what God has done with yielded men. People that are dead. People that don't care about themselves. People are not that focus about what they can achieve. I'm a living testimony. Me and my wife, we are here. We had plans. The plans are gone. It's finished. The, the plans are finished. I remember when we got married, I did a whole PowerPoint presentation. A whole PowerPoint presentation. And I presented it to her in the first six months. I said, I'll do a, pre- a PowerPoint presentation showing you the next two to five years. I was prepared. I said, we'll do this, we'll do that. We'll do this and then we'll do that. Within the first eight months, that PowerPoint presentation became useless. Now, even when I plan, I'm scared. I now, now, no, no, and this is me. This is not everybody. This is not everybody. This is not everybody. But this is me. I can only plan very, very short term. People asking me, so in the next two years, where do you see yourself? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that I want to be in the will of God. That's it. But I just don't know. And if you can yield yourself to God's will, just watch what he can do with you. We sing these songs all the time. My life is not my own. Really? No, 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 really. Because you say with your mouth, but in your heart, you know it's really yours. I remember the day a person said, we're going to, to Dubai. Everyone said, amen. Casey Dubai. Dubai, everyone said, amen. Even the amen you said, go to Dubai and see no, no, go to the bar and see. The way you want to dress. Oh, you don't know the laws that, that, that prevent you from even dressing there. You have to be covered from head to toe. Be careful of the prayers you are praying. Oh. Be very, very careful. I had flags around my neck. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I had no idea. We were saying the nations, the nations. I don't know. I don't know if I just thought the nations will come to me. <laughs> Some of you will go. It's the truth. You will go. No, no, you will go. Tell the person next to you, you will go. <laughs> you will go. <laughs> For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's time to die, guys. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Last one, Matthew. Chapter 16, verse 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, 
If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Listen, it's easier to die. Because, because if, if you want to be alive, you will now feel the strain of working to stay alive. But if you yield yourself to die, it is like you just telling God, just do what you want to do. And I believe that we trust God enough. We love him enough to know that he has your best interest at heart. So what is the problem? Why is it so hard? I'll tell you, because of your flesh. This your flesh. If you don't kill it, it will kill you. Your flesh. If you don't put it under subjection, it will put you under subjection. We have to be intentional about this thing we call flesh. You know this thing we call, the flesh doesn't even like you. You are not your flesh. You are not your body. You are a spirit. You just happen to have a body. And that body you have doesn't like your spirit. So the Bible says that they are at war with one another. The spirit and the flesh are warring against each other. The flesh that you look at in the mirror, it doesn't like you. The day I separated my spirit from my flesh, I received deliverance. The day I realized that my flesh is not me and my flesh doesn't want my best interest, I came to a certain level of understanding. So we have to be very intentional about putting our flesh under certain sacrifices of pain. Let it suffer. So of course your flesh doesn't want you to fast because it will hurt it. Of course. I remember a day I was fasting and then I was out so I couldn't break. And then I was, so, I was out for so long and I came back after 12. And then Mimi said, oh, Henry, you missed, you didn't, you didn't eat. And I said, I said, it's fine, let the flesh suffer a bit. Let it suffer a bit. Because this same flesh has caused you so much harm and problems. It has put you through so much in life. So much negativity. And you know it's crazy. After the flesh has put us into so much problems, we go and we, we reward it. The flesh has taken you to go and commit fornication. After the fornicating, you go and you feed it KFC. So now the flesh is saying, wow, I even get a present. I'm even being rewarded. But after it has put you in the ditch, you have to teach it a lesson. And you say, after you made me fall, I'm going to put you under three days fasting. This is how you have to see your flesh. But what the flesh does, it makes you feel so guilty of the wrong it has committed. I lead you somewhere and I make you feel bad. So bad that you keep on rewarding me. This is the flesh. Today, man, I open your eyes to your flesh. <laughs> this is your flesh. It will kill you before you kill it. I'm telling you. If you do not take it seriously. So Paul said something. He said, he said I buffet my body. I put it under subjection. I train my body. So there shouldn't be one week, one week you shouldn't do at least one day fasting. And it's not that you are fasting for something. You are fasting to teach your body who's in control. Just throw in an extra day. Just to teach it a lesson. This is how you overcome your flesh. This is how you die. You die by putting yourself in inconvenient situations. This is how you die. But the flesh doesn't want to be inconvenienced. The flesh doesn't want to go above and beyond. 
The flesh doesn't want to do what it doesn't want to do. So with this understanding, you have to make it do what it doesn't want to do. So somebody will ask you, can you drive three hours to come and pick me up? The flesh will say, are you stupid? This is how you die. Sacrifice. I'm telling you how to die so you can live. I've come to understand the love language of God is sacrifice. If you want to please him, sacrifice. If you want him to be happy, sacrifice. And if the kingdom of God is filled with people who understand sacrifice, we'll go further. If everybody is willing to sacrifice themselves for another. I know, I understand. Because people are people. So when they see that you are sacrificing, they take advantage. So it's important that you build a certain defense. That even as you are sacrificing, you are not being taken advantage of. But everybody, there has to be something you say to yourself every week. Have I gone above and beyond? Have I done something I didn't want to do? Don't wait until you get married before you do this. When I got married, I realized that marriage is all about sacrifice. It's all about compromise. It's all about doing things you might not want to do. I got married at the age of 20-something. And 20-something years of living a certain way. I've now joined with a woman who has also lived 20-something years of doing things a certain way. And if I think that I'm not going to sacrifice, then my marriage will not last. But it means that you have to practice now. Practice now so when you get to that place, it's easier. The flesh. The flesh. The flesh. Jesus got to the place of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that and a cup was presented. And Jesus said, let this cup pass by me. It, do you know it was the flesh of Jesus speaking? It was the flesh of Jesus that said that this price is too high. But very quickly, his spirit combated. And he said, not my will, but your will be done. It means your will will never let you sacrifice. Your will will never let you drink of the cup. Because the cup symbolized the sin of the world. And Jesus saw for the first time, he's about to drink sin. And because he's going to drink sin, and God and sin cannot combine, he saw himself being separated from the Father for the first time. And he said, I cannot do this. Even this, he had to sacrifice. Even this, he had to say, not my will, but your will be done. Sacrifice. It's the love language of God. It's the love language of God. Every day I'm looking for new opportunities to sacrifice. Every day I'm looking for things to do to help. To put myself, because this is how we die. People can come to you with certain issues. All they require is for you to just go out of your way. But we have a generation that is so selfish. So selfish. All we think about is ourselves. Even when we are helping somebody, we want to see how it can benefit us. If I'm to be inconvenienced, I need to at least benefit in some way. If I'm going to drive three hours to pick you up, buy me food. There is always something you have to say in response to your sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. When Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, there was nothing he asked in return. There was nothing. He said, okay, if I'm about to do this, oh God, then please give me this. Whether you give me or you don't give me, I will do it. And then God said something. 
He said, now I know that he fears me. So did God not know? Of course he knew, but he was waiting for the evidence. He was waiting for the thing that confirmed what he knew. Yes, God knows about you. He's waiting for you to confirm it. Your destiny is written. But is it possible for you not to fulfill destiny? Yes. Because God will not force you to obey. The cost of living in the kingdom has increased. There is more God is requiring of us, guys. For this kingdom agenda to come to pass, there's more he's requiring of us. For some of you, it's going to be higher than others. But just know that the grace he's given you is sufficient. Know that he will not put you in a situation you cannot bear. If he has said it, he will do it. If he has put you there, he will provide. Can we come back to a place where we trust God again? Where we put him before ourselves. Where we understand that his will is better than our will. The cost of living has increased. I understand that there are many types of death, personally. I've, I've, I've researched and studied that there are different types of death, even in the context I'm speaking. Because when we say die to your flesh, it's very broad. We have death to your will. Death to your will. That's where Jesus was when he said, not my will, but your will be done. Everybody has a will. Everybody has, has what they want. Everybody, you have desires. So people use the scripture. They will say, they will say, oh, God will grant me the desires of my heart. But they don't read what is before that. It says delight in the Lord. If you don't delight in the Lord, there's no way your desires will be met. I'm just telling you that for free. And to delight in the Lord is to know what he wants concerning you and, and yield. So you have to die to your will. Do you think Jesus wanted to come and do what he did? Revelation chapter 5 tells us that there was a large cry in heaven. And they said, who is worthy enough to take the scroll? And there was silence. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. He saw that nobody wanted to do it, so he took it. He left the place of divinity, came to humanity. He walked amongst men, God amongst men. He died the death of a sinner, but he was innocent. Do you think that was his personal will? Enjoying life with the angels in heaven. He comes down to be beaten and spat at. You must die to your will. Oh, Malubran Salemahandos. Pelebro Shapalan de Elemenes. Rakatus Lemena. For God is calling people closer. He's calling people closer even now. He's calling people closer. He's opening the eyes of many. He's causing us to see ourselves for who we truly are. We must die to our will. We must die to our lust. Die to your lust. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It must die. Those edges that cause you to walk backwards, you must die to them. That uncontrollable desire must die. We all have them. We all have those edges. But we must put them to death. We must die to our lust. It's something David couldn't understand. 
It's something even Eve couldn't understand. They had lusts. The Bible says that David saw a woman barfing. And the lust was speaking. His body was speaking. His flesh was speaking. And his flesh was telling him, call her to you now. If the man was dead to his lust, do you think he would have called her? But his lust was so alive. He commanded her to be brought to him. And the rest is history. He was too alive to his lust. I'm telling you, amongst young people, lust is the thing that we must die to very, very quickly. It will end you. It will finish you. And though God is a God who forgives, unfortunately, men, men find it very hard to forgive. So you can make a mistake today. God will forgive you today. It will take you five years to restore your reputation. And the assignment upon your life given by God. Yes, it's yay and amen. But because of your failure to die to lust, it is now distorted. The estimation time for you to arrive at your destination has now gotten longer. Is God still God? Yes. Is God still loving? Yes. Has God forgiven you? Yes. But we live amongst men. And the Bible said something quite interesting. He said, God looks at the heart, but men look at outward appearance. It means that outward appearance is something we must consider. How you are seen amongst men is important. You can't just say, only what God thinks matters. We live for God, but we serve men. Die to your lust. Number three, die to power. Die to power. Die to power. There is something that drags us towards the place of power. Towards the place of relevance. Towards the place where you are known and seen. There is something that draws men to a place of recognition. There's nothing wrong with it. But when the motives are incorrect, that's how we have African leaders that don't want to come off the throne. Because they haven't died to power. So even when they are not doing a good job, they want to remain there. It's in the church. It's in the church. We must die to power. Jesus was taken to the Sanhedrin and they accused him of things. When Jesus was being arrested, do you think he couldn't call down legions of angels to wipe them off? He could. He had the power, but he died to it. Your ability to use something you know will work and not use it is an indication you've died to power. You know you have the authority to close the mouth of a person, but you remain silent. It's an indication you've died to power. And when God knows that you have died to power, he'll give you more power. This is how the kingdom works. Somebody will say the kingdom works upside down, but I would say the kingdom works right side up. Everything else is upside down. But we become so accustomed to life in the United Kingdom that we don't know how the kingdom of God operates. Number four, die to fame. Die to fame. Die to fame. Die to the applause of men. 
We are not in this to be applauded. We are not in this to be recognized by people. We are not in this for honorariums. We are not in this for private jets and first class business plane journeys. We are not in this for followers, for blue ticks. We are not in this for all of these things. Jesus was alive for 30 years in silence. God amongst men and was silent. 30 years knowing you can do something and not do it is an indication you died to fame. Jesus could have easily got into a place at the age of 12, 13, 15, at 20, 21. He'll get to that place where he says, now I'm of age, now my fame can come to light. But he died to fame and only operated for three and a half years. Now, if it was us, at 30, three and a half years of publicity, there's no way we are ending the ministry. No, 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 no. I've just now taken off. And you're telling me my assignment is done? Oh, he had died to fame. He wasn't in it for the applause. They wanted to make him king. But he said, this is not why I've come. It's not for fame. We're in a generation where everything is Instagrammable. Everything is Instagrammable. Everything must be publicized. Everything must be shown. Everything must be done with the mindset that somebody has to see this. To the extent that there are certain things we even post. We don't post it because we know that people are not online at this time. Yeah, I'm speaking to somebody. Yeah. Some of you know the time your followers are online. So you have the picture, it's there, it's waiting. You're waiting for Saturday evening. 9 p.m. You've tracked it, everything, you know. Die to fame. Can you post at 2.30 a.m.? When everybody's asleep. But there might just be that one person that wants to see that post. And their life can change forever. That one person. A generation where we don't care about likes. Some of us, we can remove the picture if it doesn't get a certain amount of likes. I'm entering somewhere. <laughs> Die to fame. Number five. Die to your emotions. Uh, I think I'll stay here. <laughs> the way you reacted, I like it. Yeah. Die to your emotions. I told you the Lord has been talking to me about this topic for weeks now. Sunday in Germany, I preached the message, too emotional for the kingdom. Too emotional for the kingdom. Some of us, our emotions are too alive. Too emotional. Too emotional. If you have a certain level of emotion and it's still too alive, I'm telling you, the kingdom is not for you. I told them in Germany, maybe Islam is for you. I don't know. Maybe. But the kingdom of God cannot tolerate a certain level of emotion. Don't get me wrong. Emotions are important. Emotions make you human. It's the humanity of man. Jesus wept. The Bible says Jesus was sorrowful. He had emotions. But you have to learn how to turn them on and off. You have to learn how to put your emotions under subjection. Oh, the church is too emotional. Too emotional. You can come to church. The usher doesn't greet you well. You are angry. Your whole service is finished. 
because the usher didn't look at you for more than two seconds. Somebody didn't greet you the way you wanted them to greet you. So you are, you are done. People have even turned around and gone home before service started. Too emotional. The Bible says that a rich man came, the rich young man came to Jesus and says, what do I, do? What do I need to do to be born again? He said, keep the commandments. He said, I do everything. I haven't murdered, I haven't stolen, I haven't killed, I haven't done anything. He said, go and sell all your possessions and come and follow me. The Bible says he turned around sad. Jesus said that it would be harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. His sadness disqualified him from the kingdom. His emotions disqualified him from the kingdom. We are too emotional. We are too emotional. And the kingdom of God cannot flourish when we are too emotional. I always say this, that in the church you will be offended. You will be offended. If you came to church not to be offended, then you didn't come well. You will be offended. You know why? Because the church are filled with people. People. And people are people. You will be offended. You don't know what I've gone through in church. I've suffered though. I've gone, my sister, this is my sister, my blood sister, same mother, same father. She'll tell you. Stephen, I remember a day. I remember a day I was playing drums. And I wasn't the first choice drummer. And the way I was spoken to when the first choice drummer came, hurry up and go. Oh, Jesus. Ellie, I'm sure you've experienced it when you were little. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, move, move, move. Hey. That day I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. Every emotion came into me. But do you, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm bro, Jesus. I remember sitting down, and the thing is, the crazy thing is, when he told me to move, I had to sit next to the, the drummer. <laughs> I had to sit next to him and watch him. This is how you kill your emotion. This is how you kill it. And I was sitting there, sweating inside, crying inside, angry inside, sad inside. And then the Lord told me, to be angry for long is pride. Because you still think you matter. <laughs> you still think you matter. But this kingdom was never about you. So if you are told to move so that the drummer can come and do it better, move. You see, this is what we cannot, we cannot hear this in the kingdom. We can't hear this in church. Because the minute the leader tells you he's in the spirit and he says, quick, 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 move. You're offended. You're offended. So we have the church and we are filled with offended people. Offended. And there's something I've taught the church in Germany. I say offended good is conviction. If you're offended, it's good. God is convicting you. Take the offense. Use it as a conviction. Use it for your better. Emotional. I'm reminded of Moses. The Bible says Moses was a man with extraordinary abilities. We all, know, we all know the story of Moses. We know what the Lord used him to do. Mighty works to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. Had the staff and the rod. He placed it. The water turned to blood. Placed the same rod on the water. It divided into two. All the plagues, the locusts, the frogs, the, the day of darkness. All through one man called Moses. Powerful man, a prophet of God, sent to deliver a people out of captivity. Who wouldn't want to be this person? 
His destiny is written in the stars. But then you read on and then you get to a place in the book of Numbers and it says that God is talking to Moses and he said, you will see the promised land but you will not enter it. How is it possible for a man who has done all of these signs, wonders and miracles not to walk into his destiny? How is it possible? Because the people of Israel they frustrated him. Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 14, 15, 16. You see that the children of Israel are just complaining. It got to a point, they even gathered themselves and said, let us overthrow this man. Imagine, all of you decide, one day, gather and overthrow Pastor Randolph. I don't think it's possible to be honest. <laughs> Every day they're complaining. Where's the bread today? Yesterday it came at 10. Why is it coming at 10 01? They got they frustrated him so much. When he went to the mountain, he came down and they he saw that he had they had built a golden calf. I was away for 10 minutes. And you couldn't withhold yourself. They frustrated Moses to the extent. In number 17, the Bible says that God told Moses, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock so that water can come through it. That's Numbers chapter 20. Because of all the frustration, because of the built up emotion, Moses didn't speak to the rock. Mo Moses struck the rock. The Bible says he struck it twice. And God instantly said, because of this, you will not enter the, king, the kingdom of God. You will not enter the promised land. Why? Because striking the rock twice indicated that Jesus, who is the rock, will be struck twice. He will die twice. And God said, this will never happen. Jesus will only go through the punishment of men once. So the rock symbolized Jesus. Moses striking the rock once was okay. But twice, God said, no way. Because of this, you will not enter. Because of emotion. Because of his failure to cover his emotions. To control his emotions. His failure to know that, yes, I'm frustrated, but I cannot act in frustration. He missed out on a promise. How many of us are missing out on our promise because of emotions? Oh, Jesus. May the bride of Christ come to a place of maturity. Come on, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Ah. Yes, Lord. Let me know what pray had to say. It's one of those nights. It's one of those nights of reflection. It's one of those nights. It's one of those nights. I'll end with this. I'll end with this. 
One of the things I try to do is I try to be a student of revival. Meaning that I don't just look at how revival started. I also try and look at how revival ended. And I was reading about the Azusa Street Revival. And I was with my brother, Jose. And we were studying God's generals, William J. Seymour. And he was talking about the Azusa Street Revival. And according to history, the Azusa Street Revival ended because somebody was offended. William J. Seymour got married. And the person in charge of the media felt like the marriage took his attention away from the revival. So she got offended. And she transferred the offense to everybody else. And one by one, people just started to walk out and it ended the revival. This is the power of offense. That somebody can be offended and rightly so, but somebody else would attract that offense. It has nothing to do with them, but offended by association. There are some of us, we are only friends because of a common offense. And sometimes, one of the people in those two group of friends is not even the victim. And this is what happens so much in the church. Somebody is not happy with somebody, but that person has not been offended. It's just close to a person who was offended. So we are transferring hurt. And this must end. This must end. I will never, ever treat somebody as a result of how somebody close to me is treating them. Never. Never. I have a motto. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. I will give you the opportunity to prove me wrong. But because you've hurt somebody, I'm not now going to put you in the guilty category. Be wise, of course. Love from a distance when you need to. But don't transfer offense in the church. So there are people, they want nothing to do with the church. They want nothing to do with church. They love Jesus, but they hate the church. Gandhi said, I love your Jesus, but I hate your Christians. What an error. For the people re representing a man to be disliked, but the man to be liked. And we must redefine the standards of the church. It should be a place where people come and feel love. And this, they should just see it. They should just see it. But because we are too emotional. Too emotional. Too emotional. May God help our emotions. May God help our emotions. Yeah. One way that your emotions can be helped is walking in the spirit. I'm just going to leave you with that one key to help you overcome your emotions. Because emotions dwell in the soul. It dwells in the soul. In the, it's in the soul. That's where emotions dwell. And if you are very soulish, very soulish, you will walk in emotions. But the Bible doesn't tell us to walk in emotions. Galatians 5.16, it tells us, walk in the spirit so you do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit, it deafens your emotions and it gives you the ability to know when to use it and when not to use it 
Because our emotions cannot control us. We must control our emotions. Yes, you will be upset. Yes, you'll be sad. Yes, you'll be angry. Of course, we live in this world. But after 72 hours, you are still angry. The Bible says, do not let the sun come up on your anger. You can sleep and wake up and be even more angry. It's an error. It's unbiblical. Sleep is meant to be that thing that, that, that deafens anger. When you sleep eight hours, close your eyes, your soul is at rest. Wake up and you are still angry. It means it's serious. It means, it means we haven't died. The cost of living in the kingdom has increased. Bow your heads. Pray a very sincere prayer. I'm not going to ask you what to pray about. Come on, be sincere with the Lord. Be, be very open with Him. Father, I commit your children into your hands. Every single one of us I commit into your hands. Let this word not just be a word they hear, but let it be a word they actively do. We are presenting ourselves on the altar as living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable unto your God. Let this journey of Christianity let the cost of living in this kingdom not be in vain. But may everything we need to do be done in order for us to have maximum impact, relevance in our sphere and in our environment. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We exalt you. And we bless you. In Jesus' name. And let the church say amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Oh, praise God. Are we angry? I hope you are blessed. I hope you are blessed. 
Let's be on our feet. We are closing. We are closing. May everyone live here energized, fulfilled. May everyone live here with a new sense of life. May you go out and become ambassadors of the kingdom. May you indeed die so you can live. May your light so shine unto all men. And for those men to give glory unto our Father. Let this be the beginning of a journey walking with the Lord. Walking in the spirit all the days of our lives. May you never lack. May the Lord give you more grace. May he give you the abilities you need to fulfill destiny. May nobody suffer long and not see the fruits of their labor. But may your work speak for itself. May we die to our emotions. May we die to fame, to power, to lust, to shame, and to our flesh. Father, we thank you and we glorify you. Go in the strength of the Lord. In Jesus' name. We are taking our offering. If you have an offering, please don't go home with it. You can pay online. You can pay by cash. Let us share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely, all the days of our lives, Amen. God bless you and see you on Sunday. God bless you.